So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys? And welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Fernando Andalucci. By the age of 30, Fernando has built a portfolio of over 150 million in self-storage assets across the country within the last four years. Fernando diversified his investments between purchasing existing cash flowing assets, building ground up regrade facilities, and utilizing adaptive reuse conversions of big box retail stores into class A self storage. In addition to his own acquisitions, Fernando provides other self storage investors access to off market facilities at drastic discounts, capital for strategic partnerships, and opportunities for passive investors to participate in self storage syndications. Fernando, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Absolutely. Very excited. Very, very excited for today's conversation because I've been hounding on self-storage, whether I'm doing a solo episode or talking to other multifamily operators. So um, it's nice to not only have a self-storage operator, but someone my same age who can speak to, you know, what is the, the largest demographic of my listeners. So very excited for that. But um, you've obviously been hard at work um, for the last little bit. So kind of take us back to the beginning, what you were doing before this and and what led you to where you're at now. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm the son of two immigrants from Brazil. They came from, uh, they came over to the United States and kind of had the old school American dream in mind, right? Go to school, get good grades, go to a good college, graduate and go work at a fortune 50 company, retire in 40 years with a pension. Obviously, that's not the case anymore for people our age group. Uh, that being said, um, that's actually the route that I went. So when I was 16 years old, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, changed my life, uh, decided that's what I wanted to go into. But my father said, you know, hey, I'd still want you to go get an engineering degree. So I got that engineering degree, ended up working for a Fortune 50 company. I had, you know, expense card. I had a truck. I had a 401k match. I had a pension, believe it or not. Um, but I, I realized that's not what I wanted to do. And I quit within 13 months. Um, wow. Started off on the residential side of the world. So uh, first started with wholesaling contracts and then quickly scaled into uh, doing fix and flips and then um, buying, buy and hold uh, multifamily for, you know, rental income. And then around 2016, I <clears throat> was looking at the macro economy and looking at how long of a bull run we've been on. And I said, Hey man, this is not going to last much longer. I, th I thought that the market was going to crash from like 2018, 2019. Obviously I was severely wrong, which is fine. <laughs> um, I'd rather be early than late. So started selling off all my multifamily assets and single family assets. Um, at that time, I started looking at what can I get into that's going to get rid of all my headaches. And primarily most of my headaches were, you know, it came down to three words. It was tenants, toilets, and trash. Those are the, the three issues that constantly haunted me, even with third-party management in place. So then when I found out about self-storage, I said, hey, this is this is the promised land here. So uh, jumped both feet first. Um, we started off at, as we do with every new uh, industry that we go into or new asset class that we go into. We first start with wholesaling the asset because it's very low risk. You could tie up properties with nominal dollars. And then if someone that knows more than you is willing to buy it off of you at a higher price than you have it under contract, then you must be doing something right on your underwriting. After doing a few of those transactions, I bought my very first uh, self-storage buy and hold deal in Yorkville, Illinois. Um, bought it in August of 2018 for a million bucks. And then since then, we've uh, we've transacted on over $157 million of the storage. Um, the reason I say transacted is because I just sold 10 of my facilities in a portfolio sale two days ago. Wow. So that was, that was pretty nice to get a pretty big payday off of, uh, you know, properties that we've held anywhere from, you know, four years to as short as six months. 
Um, so that was, that was a really good exit. Cap rates are crazy right now on the retail side of the world. Um, the off-market side is still, still doing really well. And so then our, uh, looking forward, our goal is to be a top 20 operator by 2030. We're looking to have about 200 assets under management that would put us at roughly a valuation of about $1.6 billion. Um, that equates to about eight and a half million net rentable square feet of storage. Wow. That's incredible. And if you guys know anything about self-storage, the, the deal sizes are typically smaller than, than like multifamily apartments. So to amass that large of a portfolio, even now at the 157 million stage is, uh, is pretty impressive. So obviously self-storage is becoming, you know, more of a, a sexy asset class, let's put it right. It was definitely not even back then. So what really stood out about it back then to you guys, you know, despite it not being the most appealing, um, I'm, I'm sure I know, probably know the answer to that, but also, <laughs> yeah. uh, getting investors and getting investors on board back before it was like the cool asset class. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm an engineer by training, so I'm very data driven. I'm also extremely risk averse compared to let's say other real estate investors. Now you ask some of my old coworkers and they think I'm extremely risk tolerant because of the fact that I'm willing to quit a W2 job and go, you know, work for myself. But you know, that's another conversation in and of itself. <laughs> So when I was looking over at the data over the last 40 years of self-storage, a lot of very interesting things started popping out to me. So the very first thing I looked at was between 1994 and 2017, um, and that's I used that data set because that's I started jumping into storage in earnest at the end of 2017, early 2018. Um, I saw that self-storage returned on average about 17.43% per year. Um, compared to say the S and P 500 over that same period of time, which returned about 7.54%. Uh, when you look at multifamily, it did a little bit better at 13.3%. So that 4% difference may not seem like a lot, but when you realize that that's compounding year over year, if you put a hundred thousand dollars in, let's say apartments, uh, in 1994, at the end of 2017, that'd be worth about 1.7 million. That same 100000 invested in self-storage in 1994, by 2017, it was worth a little over $4 million, so over double the return. Uh, so that was the interesting part, number one. And usually the way investments work is the higher re the reward, the, the higher the risk as well. And so I started looking at the downsides of self-storage. And what I found is it, that was actually not the case. There's asymmetric risk return metrics on self-storage. So if you look at, let's say, the last few major recessions that we've gone through. So let's go back to the 07, 09 financial crisis. The S&P 500 dropped 22%. Multifamily dropped about 7%. Storage only dropped about 3.5%. So wow. uh, really low. And this was a survey done across um, real estate investment trusts. So this is from the National Association of REITs. So that's, that's one side. Let's go a little bit something, you know, a little bit closer to our hearts here and a little bit more recent, which is the, the, the pandemic. So according to TREP, which is a commercial mortgage-backed securities research firm, of the 1,700 CMBS loans that were made to self-storage investors in the first three quarters of the pandemic, only three were delinquent. That's a 0.17% delinquency rate. During that same time, multifamily was defaulting at a rate of 1,800% higher, 18 times the default rate of self-storage. So um, when you look at the downside risk, self-storage does really well. It's actually, we call it a recession resilient asset because when people have to downsize or move or you know people have to move in together, um, they usually have to use storage. So those are the two main reasons that got me really uh, interested in storage. But then some of the secondary reasons were also near and dear to my heart. So for example, um, we were getting much better leverage uh, available to us from banks than what we were getting on multifamily. Um, the market was extremely fragmented. Uh, so what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at the ownership across all of the, um, the all the facilities in the United States, Depending on what metrics you look at, there's roughly 60 to 75,000 self-storage facilities in the United States. If you break apart that ownership, 18% are owned by the six largest publicly traded REITs. 
So that's a very low amount compared to other real estate assets. Then another nine to 10% were owned by the next 100 largest operators. I'm included in that group of operators. Uh, so that means that there was like 70 to 72% of the facilities owned out there were owned by mom and pop operators or single facility operators, which means there's a lot of opportunity for consolidation still left in this space. That's how you make a lot of money in storage is by wrapping up portfolios of properties and then selling them off to you know, the, next, the next fish in the food chain. Uh, so that was one of the opportunities that I saw. And then, you know, talking specifically about the headaches, I used to own a lot of multifamily and let's say class C and class D areas because I was, I was chasing yield. And those tenants usually come with their fair share of challenges. Um, evictions in some of the areas I own properties, like Chicago, for example, could take eight, nine months. And this is pre-pandemic evictions, right? Jeez. Uh, with storage, that's not the case. Instead of it being guided by landlord tenant law, it's actually guided by lien law or property law, which means the second someone puts their possessions into your unit, you're automatically given a de facto lien against them. And if they don't pay, you're allowed to auction off their, uh, you know, their, their belongings. So that allows us to turn units within 30 to 45 days from the date of delinquency. And actually, the way the state laws are written, they're written in our favor, as opposed to, let's say, in habitation based real estate, which is, you know, multifamily or single family, anything where someone lives in your asset, the laws are written in, in favor of the tenants for the most part. Um, so that was a, a really good thing to see on our side. And it allows us to, you know, the statutes of each of the states, they're pretty similar to one another with some exceptions. They allowed you to charge lien fees and late fees and auction fees. So by the time we auction off that unit and get a new tenant in place within 30 to 45 days of the original delinquency, we're actually usually break even or sometimes because of the fees that we can charge, we're actually making a little bit of money on those evictions. That's not usually the game plan, but it does help out. Uh, as opposed to say in a multifamily property where you know you're looking at one to two months vacancy plus you have to pay one to two months to a realtor to place a tenant for you then you have to pay one to two months in turnover cost of you know cleaning the carpets replacing the carpets painting cleaning all the uh, all the appliances so it's just a much more efficient business that sides with the owner as opposed to the the renter the the tenant yeah, absolutely. Wow. That, um, I love all the, the breakdown of numbers there. I'm a big, uh, data guy as well. So very fascinating to hear that. Um, love still hearing that 70% still mom and pop owned, uh, you know, pretty recognizable when you're driving around, you can really just spot them. They kind of, well, at least now that I'm getting into it, they stick out. It's funny now driving around and being like, well, wow, there's self storage there. I've been driving yeah. for 10 years, but, um, <laughs> But yes, so that, that's awesome. And so kind of talk about then, you know, first getting into it, getting investors on board and, and what that was like, you know, I know a lot of investors are data driven, right? So the very sophisticated ones delivering that data to them can kind of be a no brainer in terms of them jumping on board. But for those that, you know, for the majority, that's not the case, let's say. So kind of talk about what that looks like. Yeah. So I got some really great resources on this. So typically people try to talk to other people as if they are the ones receiving the information. So for example, I'm a very data-driven person. So I want to see and hear data first and foremost. I don't care about the sales pitch and all that other stuff. The, the unfortunate part is we are a minority in the population. I call us the analytical types, right? We only make decisions based off of data and not emotions. Um, that is not how the majority of investors operate. So here's some resources that help me really scale my capital raising side of the company. So the first is a book called They Ask, You Answer. It's about a guy in New England that sold, um, I want to say they were like, uh, like, what's, what's the name of that material? Fiberglass, fiberglass pools in the Northeast. And he ended up dominating the space because he realized that people had a bunch of questions about his industry and no one was answering them. So he specifically went out on a education campaign, educate your market to dominate it. So that's reading number one, they ask you answer. Number two is how, the, how to do the actual pitch itself. So there's two books that I recommend 
to craft your pitch. The first one is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. It's a book about tactical empathy. People say it's a book about negotiation, but that's really not what it is. Um, tactical empathy is what the book is about. Uh, the second book is called um, Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. And Pitch Anything talks about how we have kind of these three levels of our brain, right? You have it at the very base level, you have this croc brain that processing processes things as either a fear response or an intrigue response. And then it kicks up to a higher level process, the limbic system to make sense of what those emotions are. And then eventually, once you get through those first two hurdles, then you, you're finally processing things in your prefrontal cortex, which is the newest part of the brain. The unfortunate part about most pitches is people try to pitch towards the prefrontal cortex without addressing the, the first two below. And what ends up happening is then you have people that don't trust you on your pitch or they stop paying attention or they lose, um, you know, they lose focus. So one of the things that I learned and I made a huge significant change in my presentations is prior to this, my capital raise presentations were two hours long. Now they're 15 minutes. And my rate of investment literally almost 10 X to when I made that change, because who wants to sit through a two hour presentation, right? Get to the meat and potatoes, and then you can give all the due diligence documents later on for them to review. Now, I'm, this is super, super 30,000 foot view here. So, you know, please go read the books. Um, the amount of value that you'll get out of them is absolutely phenomenal. So once we took those three pieces of information and, and started formulating a plan. What we did realize, like I said before, is to, to dominate the market, you need to educate it. So do thought leadership, go on podcasts like this and, and teach your investors what they need to know, teach them about the downsides and the upsides, put out a bunch of education as free education, right? I'm not a big fan of, you know, making people pay for education, the whole guru space, because it, it, it has its own headaches on the backside. You know, typically the, when you look at, statistics on real estate gurus, less than 5% of the people that will pay for these courses will actually make their investment back, let alone become successful. And I don't want to deal with that. And it's not because the gurus themselves are bad teachers. It's just because of the people that get the information. They either act on it or they don't. And a lot of the, the self-starters are a very small percentage of the population, right? If not, then everyone and their mother would be an entrepreneur, and that's not the case. Uh, so I'd rather give out all that information for free, knowing that that one to five percent that are the self-starters, over time that they'll they'll reach out and there will be potentials to partner, there'll be potentials to to, to form, um, you know, good relationships, things like that. Uh, and then just making sure that you're out there. It's interesting now when investors schedule time to speak with me on my website, by the time they actually get to me and talk to me, uh, they always say kind of the same thing. It's like, Fernando, I feel like I already know you because I've absorbed so much of this free content that you put out into the world that I, I almost inherently trust you, even though I've literally never met or talked to you before. Um, so that's why podcast circuits are really great. That's why posting a lot of education on social media channels is great. Speaking at industry trade shows and conferences to give you that authority. You know, I, I speak at the Inside Self Storage World Expo. It's the largest self storage conference in the world. I speak at the SSA, both nationally and on the state level. I'm, a, I'm an authority in the space because of this. And it only took me, a, it's not like you need 40 years to become an authority. Tim Ferriss in his book, uh, The 4-Hour Week, Four Hour Work Week, talks about how to become an expert in six weeks or less. For us, it took us about maybe two to three years, um, but we weren't doing everything that he was saying in the book. So another, another resource for you guys to check out is 4-Hour Work Week and look at specifically the paragraph that talks about becoming a, an expert in your field in a very short order, uh, a short, short period of time. Wow. Okay, podcast is over. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> that was incredible. Thank you so much. I can just hear your passion and your, um, your intelligence. Right. And, and fully explains why by the time, you know, an investor gets to you, they're like, Hey, I already know you, uh, because you're clearly you're articulating it so well, but it's also very obvious how, how much information you actually could, <laughs> you know, like fully, no wonder you have a, had a two hour pitch in the beginning, right? You just knew so much. Right. And that's one of the hardest things when you're talking to an investor. And I even noticed that talking to my friends, is all of a sudden I'll see the gloss go over in their eyes and I'm like, and they're gone. And they're gone. 
And so, you know, I even, you know, even my own, you know, network, I have to kind of, okay, not everybody's as passionate as you are, Johnny, it's, it's okay. Um, but that's awesome. So let's kind of drill down now then. Um, and, and if you don't mind, I can actually pull up one of my presentations real quick and I can just go through the, the agenda, if you will, it's super quick. So I start yeah. off my presentation. I say, Hey, this presentation is going to take 15 minutes. So you, you tell them up front how long the time constraint is so that they already are checked in. And then you tell them the agenda. So I say, here's what we're going to cover in this next 15 minutes, the team, why now is the time to invest in the big idea. Then the second thing we're going to cover is the numbers and the secret sauce. After that, we're going to actually go over the physical offering. And then number four, we're going to see if we're a good fit. And then number five is, is we'll have a, you know, two to five minutes for questions. It's that, that's it. That's, that's all insane. I pitch. It's a 15 minute presentation, 15 minutes, and it gets all the points across. And the best part is what I notice a lot of syndicators doing wrong is they try to give all of their due diligence, everything in the presentation as if like, this is the whole underwrite. That's not what you should do. The presentation is to get them excited, right? Get that crock brain oct activated, making sure it's not a threat. And then if they're still interested in learning more, they can request due diligence materials or go into the investor portal and, and on their own time, you know, go line by line with a fine tooth comb, looking at all your numbers and all your projections. You don't need to go through all that in the presentation. The presentation is get them excited about the deal and build a report. That's it. Absolutely. I once sat in a webinar and they went through almost dollar by dollar, the CapEx budget and what it was going to go toward. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, er yeah. So that's incredible advice. I love that. And I know um, that, so I'm in a mastermind group, Raise Masters, uh, particularly, Me too. Oh, are you? Yeah. Stop. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Adam. You guys and, are uh, witnessing live that we're both realizing we're in the exact same <laughs> mastermind group. <laughs> Hunter and Adam. Yes, of course. Yep. Wow. Okay. Well, that's even better. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's amazing. Yes. And that is the biggest thing people struggle with is the webinar that I've noticed with talking to people. Okay. Awesome. How long have you been in? Uh, maybe about, I think I joined December. So only about half a year or so. And I'm surprised that Adam hasn't connected us yet. Um, but shout out to Adam and Hunter. They're uh, yeah, incredible they do a people. great job. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, I think that's just another, another piece for your listeners too. You got to realize that there are everything that has ever been done with an exception of like some breakout companies like Elon Musk and stuff has been done before. Yes. So there's no need to recreate the wheel. Thank you. Go pay the Thank 10, you. 20 grand to join the mastermind and just get a data dump of everything and the best practices. There's no reason to recreate this wheel. My entire business structure is literally the raise master structure because I came in raw, right? I had only worked in the industry for a year with another group, aka that's where that webinar was. Yeah. And um, like you look at my background, it's like pretty similar, to, right? Like I, Hunter's like, copy it, do it, you know? Right. You got, and that's the thing about entrepreneurship, right? Is so many people think they need to have a Facebook idea. And if you do have a Facebook idea, the thing you need to understand about Facebook, you guys, it's a tech company. There are a thousand tech companies before them that they were able to emulate in terms of their structure and model. Certainly the idea was original, but the way the business operates, it's not original. And I think so many people get stuck in that space where they're like, oh, I, I don't know how to do this. And it's like, yeah, none of them really did. But you just look at what came before and you just emulate that. And I think that if you're also looking at ideas like that, the percentage of success, I almost use the analogy of the starving artist, right? If you want one of these unicorn ideas like you, Uber or Facebook or stuff, you know, there's it's a one in over a million chance you actually make money. Or you can do what has made people wealthy since the beginning of time, which is real estate. Uh, it's, you may not be a billion dollar company in a year, but I'm going to guarantee that you'll be financially free in three to five years, no matter what. So it's, it's much, it has a much higher probability of success. I know it is fascinating. And that's, that's where I see the gloss go over in my friend's eyes because <laughs> I'm trying, I like, I want everyone to come with me, you know, like, Hey guys, look what I found. Right. Come, come with me. Um, Awesome. Well, so 
this has been incredible. What what is your so now you're obviously well established, right? You're you're past the beginning phase. Right. Um, I know a lot of my listeners there, but a lot of them, you know, are are kind of where you're at or, or getting close to that stage. What does your day to day look like now, and what what's kind of changed about what what your role is potentially, and and what you do on a day to day basis? Yeah. So in the beginning, I I wore all the hats, right? Uh, when I say I, it is me and my business partner Stephen. So we it was just a two man team. In the beginning, it started it was just a one man team, and I got him, I conned him into joining me. Um, after I showed him a cup a couple picture of checks every once in a while, <laughs> um, and so that was the hardest part. So there's a great book that explains this process of growing a company, two great books. The first one, which is more high level is called the E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. It talks about how you start off as a technician and as a technician, then you go up to a manager level and from the manager level, you go up to an owner level. And some technicians don't make good managers or owners. So for example, in the book, they talk about, I forgot the name of the, the woman, but she made amazing cupcakes. And just because she was good at making cupcakes doesn't mean that she was good at managing people that make cupcakes or running a company that has managers that manage people that run cupcakes. So that's a very good book to read. The other one is called Traction by Gina Wickman. Traction is more of a blueprint. So it's really dense. Um, I'm going to warn you right now, but it gives you a step-by-step -step process of how to build a company. So in the beginning, I was wearing all the hats. As I started growing the company, we were very conscious of downloading or exporting the information we had our, in our head into physically written processes and procedures so that we can then go ahead and delegate that to someone else that had a lower pay rate, right? So for example, as the owner, in the beginning, you start doing everything, which could be you know $8 an hour tasks or even less. But eventually, once you start making money, your hourly rate may be $100, $200, $1,000 an hour. It doesn't make sense for you to do something that you can pay someone else to do much less, You know, make that spread. That's all a business owner is. So how do you make a spread on tasks and activities versus your own pay rate? So nowadays, um, the majority of my time in the company is equity and debt. That's basically all I do. So it's thought leadership, like we're doing right now. It is talking with banks and debt lenders, and it is talking with investors and, and soliciting, um, you know, equity investments into our deals. Awesome. And and what does that uh, typically look like? Are you talking to lenders on a day to day basis? Uh, you know, one thing I like about self storage too is you have the SBA. Now you guys couldn't get an SBA loan at this point, but um, that's another awesome thing about it. So, you know, talking to lenders, you know, kind of talk about what that looks like. Yeah. So uh, typically my day starts off. Um, I wake up, I go for an hour walk around the block. Um, during that walk, I'm either listening to books or taking calls. Those calls are usually going to be with equity investors or lenders. Um, not only me soliciting them, but because of where we are, as far as our notoriety in the industry goes, people reaching out and scheduling calls with me on our website. You know, I have my little, you know, Calendly link everywhere. It's on my email, it's on my website. So you can just jump in. Again, I also make sure not to waste time. So there is a pre vetting process that to schedule a call with me, you have to fill out a, a questionnaire and you have to be very specific about what your agenda is for the call. And if I don't think it's worth my time, I just won't approve the call. Or I guess now my assistant won't approve the call. Um, but yeah, it's it's that's what I start off with the more in the morning. Then I usually uh, just do batching of emails from ten to noon. I'll I'll crush all the emails out, uh, and then usually from noon to about four o'clock, that's my deep work. That's where I'm putting together loan packages. I'm putting together presentations, deal analysis. Um, uh, deal structuring, joint venture partnerships. And then usually by four o'clock, I'm in the gym and I'm kind of done with, done for the day. So it's a lot better now. When I first started off, I was working 16 to 18 hours a day, Easily. sleeping Easily. six hours you know, or less, which is not good. You got to realize at our level, what we're getting paid to do is not put together deals. What we're getting paid to do is think. So if you do not schedule time in your day to think deeply and problem solve, you're doing a disservice to yourself. Yes. And one of the things that comes with thinking is proper sleep. I don't care who you are. The people out there that say, oh, I can just operate fine on five hours. You're lying to yourself. And it's actually a trick that our brain plays on ourselves. Mm -hmm. When you're inebriated, every one and a half hours that you lose of sleep is the equivalent of having a 0.08, I'm sorry, a 0 0.08 blood alcohol level as far as motor wow. function and cognitive ability. So just 
you know, for me, I need to get eight to nine hours because that's when I'm operating on all gears, right? All cylinders are firing. Yes. Wow. I, that's so well put, right? Uh, because I know we can all think of a time when we got four hours of sleep and you wake up and you feel so spry. You're like, oh, wow, I only got four hours, but I feel so great. Is there something to this? But like you said, your brain is tricking you. Right. If you actually had to really do a deep motor function, you would realize that your cognitive ability is, is decreased significantly. I didn't realize that about an hour, uh, hour and a half of sleep though, compared to, um, out, cause that's like the legal limit is point. Of right. That's yeah. And that's, that's the craziest thing is look, look at all the people driving sleep deprived. It's worse than driving drunk. Your, your reaction times are slowed. Your motor functions are slowed. Your cognitive ability is slowed. Um, so the, the hour and a half, the reason that's the metric is because that's typically one REM whole REM cycle uh, is about an hour and a half in length. Um, so I'm always shooting for eight to nine hours. That's, that's my goal. And when people tell me that they're, you know, look at how successful and how efficient they are, cause they can only sleep four hours. Really what that means to me is that you don't have a grasp on your life and you don't actually know what you're producing. You haven't done time studies. You haven't done you know, analysis of what your take home is. I mean, it's just, it's such a dumb brag that you only sleep four hours a day. It's, I mean, it truly is so stupid. <laughs> I love this so much. Oh man, because I've been saying this stuff and, and, and unfortunately I don't quite have the resume that you have. So it doesn't stick as well. Right. So I'm really, really glad you're correct. Uh, I'm really, really glad that uh, you're saying this. So I don't sound quite so crazy, but let's uh, kind of jump back here to self storage, pull out your very muddy uh, crystal ball. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning um, on what cap rates are compressing, unless you're finding off market deals, a lot right. of our off market deals still out there, obviously, if you know how to go and, and find them and, and can do the things that can find, uh, to find those deals. But what do you see for the future of this asset class specifically? Yeah. I mean, I think the easiest thing to do is just to look at what happened with the multifamily space over the last 40 years. So there is a push for consolidation. There's a lot of easy money floating around the economy right now. Unfortunately, a lot of that easy money is not in the hands of the lay person, but in the hands of large private equity funds, hedge funds, things like that. Uh, and they're looking for places to put that cash that is a hedge against inflation, number one, but also recessions and has the ability to produce good cash flow. So what I think we're going to see is what we're continuing to see right now. Uh, you see these big dogs that are buying, you know, billion dollar portfolios. And there's a, I, I referenced this earlier, there's a food chain, right? So in the beginning, you may be a single property operator, but then very quickly you start amassing a portfolio, especially if it's regionally based. That regional portfolio of maybe five to 10 properties, you can sell to what I call aggregator funds. Those aggregator funds will then go buy 10 to 20 of these 10 property portfolios, and they'll sell a 200 property portfolio to the public storages, the extra spaces, the big guys. So um, we're seeing this huge push towards consolidation. However, unlike multifamily, which you referenced earlier, you know, in multifamily, you can go and you can put out 200, 300, 400 million dollars on one asset, some giant development, some giant, you know, community. Storage is not the case. I mean, with some exceptions of some really high cost markets like downtown Manhattan, you know, downtown San Francisco, you know, most of the times a lot of these assets, even if they're REIT get grade, class A, they they top out at 20 to 30 million bucks a piece. And really anything under, you know, 5 million bucks, the big guys aren't even interested in. So that gives us opportunity as investors to go in and buy these mom and pop deals, do these value adds, turn them around and aggregate them into larger portfolios to then exit to a larger, um, you know, a, a larger institution that has very low cost of capital. The reason why, you know, it's funny, people don't really understand what cap rates are all about and why cap rates are even used. So cap rate is a measure to uh, compare different real estate or different investments in general, uh, real estate specifically, against each other, maybe multifamily, maybe single family, maybe uh, self-storage. But the real metric is to see what their spread is over their cost of capital. So the reason why you see some people buying properties at 
you know, extra space just did some crazy sale at like three point something percent cap rate. The reason they were able to do that is because their cost cap was so low. They went into Europe, into the bond market. They offered a like seven eighths of 1% bond. They raised half a billion dollars that way. And then they got a bunch of cheap debt from life insurance companies and PE firms, hedge funds at like 2%. So their blended cost of capital is like, you know, 1.8 to 2%, something like that. And so if they buy a portfolio, at say 3.8% cap rate, they're literally doubling their money overnight, right? So we can't buy at those rates because when we go to a bank now, I mean, the date of this airing, I don't know what this is going to be, but, you know, as of end of, you know, May, beginning of June, you know, you're buying self-storage facilities and you're putting 5% debt on it maybe five and a quarter. So that means I need to buy deals that are in, you know, at least 200 basis points above that. So seven cap, maybe an eight cap, um, or, you know, go off market and start getting these, you know, nine to 11% cap rates as well. So it's, it's, and it's, that's not necessarily needs to be the going in cap rate, but the stabilized cap rate over your, over your debt. Right. So that's the, the, the piece that's very interesting to me in this, in this, industry is this consolidation that we're seeing right in front of our eyes and the ability to profit from that consolidation. Cause these big guys, they don't have time to do all the little acquisitions of one-off properties. It's really literally not worth their payroll to spend on that. So that's where you have an opportunity as a newer investor to come in, buy a couple properties, portfolio them and then sell them off. Wow. That's awesome. I love that. Thanks so much uh, for sharing all of that insight. Um, so as we wind down here, I've got five questions I ask all the guests. It's the final five. Uh, first question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Okay, this is going to sound terrible. So I'm going to say it first, and then I'm going to explain it. So I had a mentor a long time ago. Uh, he's actually now in the self-storage space. I know him. And he told me to go where poor people are not allowed to go. And he said this to me in my response to how do I raise money for deals? Because at the time I had no idea. I mean, I was 22, 23 years old at the time when I had this mentor. And so I was like, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you need to go to play typically high net worth individuals. They pay for S exclusivity. They pay to get away from people that are not high net worth. So what does that mean? That means paying for mastermind groups. That means paying for country clubs, paying for going to, uh, you know, um, like a, a private members club, like here in Chicago, I'm part of uh, the university club. Um, all these things, they cost money. And your average person that doesn't have any money can't afford to get into the door. Yacht clubs is another perfect example or boat clubs, right? So even though it's not a specifically a place to raise money, typically you do a lot of raising money at these places because you, you're rubbing shoulders with people, a lot of cash. You end up striking up a conversation. They ask you what you do. You ask them what they do. And they say, oh, real estate, what's that all about? And I say, well, you know, a lot of my investors are making really great returns. Here's what they're looking like. What do you mean your investors? What do you mean returns? Like, how do I get involved? How do I get these, you know, double digit uh, returns? So, so uh, because of that, I went out and I started spending a bunch of money when at the time when I had no money, I was literally putting this on credit cards to join mastermind groups that were 30, 40 grand a year. Um, uh, you know, joining uh, these 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 um, private members clubs, joining country clubs, yacht clubs, things like that. And that was one of the easiest ways to start raising money uh, in the beginning cycles. What people got to realize is you don't just day one start raising money from insurance companies. That's not how it works. There's levels that you have to get through. So in the beginning, people are investing on you because they know, like, and trust you, and they may not know anything about the investment you're working on. So this is your friends and family, right? Outside of your friends and family, once you start producing a track record with them, then they start telling their friends. So now you're starting to get friends of friends and family investing. So again, it's they're investing because someone knows, likes, and trusts you. But then the next stage after that, you take your, your experience and your track record and you start propelling it and broadcasting it to the general community. And that's when you used to have people that literally don't know anything about you at all. And they're more interested in your track record and in the deal specifically. Uh, but knowing you always helps, you know, it's shortening that rapport time. And that's why, like I said, this thought leadership and talking on podcasts is really good because people feel like they connect with you and they know who you are without ever 
meeting with you. And at that point, then you could start really leveraging that to go to more of the um, professional capital allocation companies, right? This is going to be your quasi institutionals, your which you know account uh, like small family offices or medium sized family offices, um, wealth uh, management firms, uh, I, uh, uh, RIAs, registered investment advisors, and then you take that track record over a couple of years, and that's what you can propel up to go to the institutional guys, where now you're getting investments from pension funds, from states, you know, police pension funds, um, insurance companies, uh, sovereign in wealth funds where literally countries will invest in deals. Wow. Um, so there's always like these levels that you want to go to. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to go all the way up because the higher you go up, the more control you give away. I don't know if that answered the question. Not, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Long answer to a short question, but that was incredible. Uh, and that is really great to get that perspective, right? So you know, as entrepreneurs and, and anybody, right, we all daydream, of course, you know, and if we all, at least for me, I, you know, like, one day when I get to that echelon, someone's going to ask me, oh, did, but anybody who ever says like, oh, did you ever imagine your podcast would become the top? Like, I hate when they're like, oh, I never could have imagined this. Like, yes, you yes, did. Yes, you did. <laughs> July. Because you wouldn't have gotten into it if you weren't imagining yourself being at the top. So Gotta set BHAG goals, big, hairy, audacious goals. <laughs> exactly. right, if you shoot for the moon, you'll land amongst the stars, even if you miss. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Uh, second question. What is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Yeah, this is this is one that I've been talking about since I started. Uh, when I picked up Rich Dad Poor Dad when I was 16, the biggest thing that I wanted as a why was I want to be able to do the things that I want to do with the people that I want to do when I want to do it. And that takes, you know, it takes the ability to have time freedom, number one. So not having to clock in at a physical office every day from nine to five. Um, it takes financial freedom, being able to, you know, pay for experiences and events that maybe potentially your friends and family could not afford and being able to do that without any, uh, any expectation of repayment um, at all. Uh, so that's been huge. And then finally, you know, once you start making, it's, it's interesting how you grow as your wealth goes up, you know, eventually first you want to just take care of your needs, right? When I first started in real estate, I started with credit card debts. I didn't know how I was going to pay my more, my rent. I didn't know I was going to pay for groceries. Then once I got about $75,000 a year, then I started feeling a little bit more comfortable, but I didn't feel like I had money, right? I just had enough money to live and meet all of my obligations. Then as my money started to substantially increase and I would no longer worried about money on a day-to-day -day basis, like when I remember the one of the greatest feelings that first started was going to the grocery store and not looking at the price of food labels when I was buying, just like whatever, if I want it, I'll throw it in there. But then once money is taken care of and you feel comfortable and you have enough money for your investments, then it's like, how do I make an impact in the world? How do I how do I help people that are less fortunate than me? And it could be friends and family. It could be people in your local community that are in need, or it could be people in the, in the, you know, the world community. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of charity work with uh, uh, Jeff Hoffman. He has a world youth horizons where he um, provides safety and education and housing for um, you know, at risk uh, youths, not only in Africa, but across the, across the world itself. And these are the things that, once you have enough money to meet your own obligations, it's almost an obligation to go ahead and start making the world around you a better place. And that is one of the most selfishly, that is the one of the most fulfilling feelings you can have um, when you, and truly the happiness comes from that um, when you're able to give back and help people that are less fortunate than you that were dealt a, you know, a bad set of cards. Wow. That's incredible. I love that so much. That's absolutely my, my ultimate goal. I lean more towards a um, huge mental health advocate. And so that's my ultimate goal is, is going to be mental health um, for sure. And particularly with, with young children, um, you know, hopefully getting to them before <laughs> they get to where I was when I realized that I was needed to fix some things. So, yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Thank you for that. Uh, favorite non real estate or investment related book. Oh, this is easy. Um, Vagabonding by Rolf Potts, the art of long-term world travel. Wow. Okay. Any goals to get to that, to, you know, eventually yeah. try uh, it? August 22nd, I booked a one-way ticket to Brazil. <laughs> Sweet. 
<laughs> Sweet. Well, I'm glad we got to you before that. That's incredible. Right? <laughs> nice. So it's an interesting book. The reason I like it is everyone thinks that travel is this end goal that they're going to make all their money. They're going to retire and they're going to travel. But the unfortunate part about that thought process is why do you want to go travel the world when your body's frail and bre breaking down, right? What people don't realize is you can travel the world and still make money, maybe even make it more money than you were net. Um, and when I say net, I mean, you know, living in the United States is extremely expensive as opposed to, let's say, living in Southeast Asia, right? So you can get paid the same or less than what you were getting paid before living in the United States and have a much better life in, say, Southeast Asia or some of these other countries that have a very low purchasing power parity to the United States dollar. Um, and there's ways... There's also a mindset shift when you do long-term world travel. It's not just about, hey, let me try to cram in as many tourist attractions as I can in five days, be stressed. By the end of the five days, I feel like I need a vacation from the vacation. Yep. Long-term world travel is like, how do I travel through Europe for two years and not make it seem like I'm on vacation, but I'm traveling while working, things like that. Very good book to read, very mind-expanding, caused me to change the way that I do a lot of things in my business. I love that. Yeah, I finally, I never grew up. Our vacations were tropical vacations, right? Resorts, that kind of thing. And don't get me wrong, like by no means am I complaining because those were fun. But I never got to experience like Europe and all of that. Finally started experiencing that last year. Of course, first thing I do is come home, become an entrepreneur because I'm like, cool. Now that's all I want to do. I'm like, <laughs> how can I set myself up to live in Europe if I want? You know what I mean? Right. And so, yes, I, I'm totally on board there. And, you know, I was by myself in Italy for a week. And you, like you said, you know, aside from scheduled tours, you're very much like, okay, I can go with the flow. I can meet people. If someone's like, hey, we're going to do this. You can go do that. And it very much becomes, you know, an experience as opposed to like, okay, Monday, we're doing this Tuesday, we're doing this, right? It, you experience it, I think is right. definitely um, what I noticed, which is amazing. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? A cheap move would be to manipulate matter because that means literally I can do anything. <laughs> I could fly, I can shoot lasers. So you're the I, second person. Manipulate matter. You're the second person to say that. And if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, Mr. Ben Lapidus himself from oh. uh, from Spartan. And uh, yes, it was him. Wow. You too. You too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ben's I love good it. Guy. Yeah, that's uh, that's the loophole right there is uh, being yeah. able to do it all if you can manipulate matter. Right. Uh, cool. Last one. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? Easy. Uh, I'll just give you my cell phone number. Shoot me a text. Text is easier than phone calls. Um, of course, if you would, if that's a little bit too, uh, you know, too much in the beginning, you can also check us out on all our social media. Uh, Impact Self Storage, Self Storage Syndicated Equities, uh, Titan Wealth Group. We put out a bunch of free content about how to get into self storage and why it's a great asset class. Um, you know, check out all our websites. Um, but yeah, so my cell phone number is area code six three zero. 408-8090. And for all those driving, pause this. Don't do this while you're while you're driving. But again, it's 630-408-8090. So what I will say, it's interesting. Every time I go into a podcast, when I tell the podcast host ahead of time that I'm going to do this, they think I'm I'm a crazy person, right? Like, why would you do this? But here's the the, the thing that I, I'm going to tell you about. Remember that statistic I gave you about gurus back? You know, only one to five percent are self-starters. Same thing with the people listening to your podcast. And I'd say it's probably even less than 1% will actually oh, take sure. the initiative and reach out. And usually the ones that are the ones that reach out are the ones I end up doing business with in the future anyway. And do you know why that is? Because as soon as you reach out, it becomes real and someone's holding you accountable and people don't like to be held accountable. No, They want to be able to just skirt on by. And uh, man, once someone's holding you accountable, that is a totally different ball game. So I got to, uh, you just touch on something that I know we're going way over time here, but I just no, got to touch on something good. that I think is so important. Um, willpower is fleeting. And I've learned this the hard way. If you really want to do something and, and accomplish something, the easiest way is to have public accountability, not only you know, one or two friends, but look at me, I, I'm telling you right now, by 2030, I'll have an eight and a half million square foot uh, portfolio that'll be worth more than $1.6 billion. So me telling 
literally hundreds of thousands of people that listen to the 200 podcasts I've been on. Like if they ever run across me in 2030, they're like, how did that, how did that sale go? You know, I'm now being held accountable by thousands of people. (laughs) 1000%. I did a solo episode on this. I was like, you can DM me. I'll hold you accountable. Right. And, and even Hunter talks about even just like you said, telling your friends, right? So I talked about earlier how I talked to death to my friends, but now they're in the background watching, right? And so now I have to actually do what I say. And so that's right. I love that so much. Um, I'll, I'll make that same offer. If you want to DM me on any of the socials, I'll hold you accountable. Just find me at it's, uh, I believe my handle is the storage stud. <laughs> so any social media, <laughs> if you, if you find that handle, I will be there. <laughs> yes. I love that so much. Fernando, you're incredible. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you, Jonathan. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So, you know, when the next video is coming out, even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know, it's coming out the next day. Uh, We have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.